matrix But these systems in control A life of simulation Making money is the goal Surrounded by distractions so you never even know That it is an illusion only made to steal your soul Wake up to reality and start believing what you see The earth's always been flat and not a globe So feel the ground under your feet The high level horizon from earth up to sky at 10,000 feet The word of God backs up our senses into your centricity Look what men like Moses wrote in the scripture and believe I know that so many of you have been looking forward to this documentary with Gary Wayne. And I know that a lot of you will want to see the interview in its entirety. So to keep from depriving you all of the entire interview I had with Brother Gary... I am going to play the entire interview, but because this is a documentary and part one was indeed so much about the Knights Templar and the Hashishan and it focused so much on the Hashishan. I am going to have to do this in somewhat of a documentary fashion, so I ask that you bear with me as we have a mixture between documentary and interview. Brother Gary, um, what I wanted to ask you most of all was basically just a broad question that will give you plenty of time to answer. And that is, what do you know about uh, the original Knights Templar that has to do with their practicing um the dark arts, anything that they were accused of, as well as um, did they have, to your knowledge, any association with the Sufis or the Order of Assassins, the Hashishan? I would, uh, I would advise people to take a step back when you're analyzing the synthesized uh, superficial strain that we get for the Knights Templar as an organization. Typically, they're presented to the uh, novice as nine poor monks within Catholicism that decide to become fighting warrior monks and to be protecting pilgrims uh, on their pilgrimages to Jerusalem in uh, just before 1100 AD, so between let's say 1050 to 10 to 1100, in that zone where there's a lot of pilgrimages going on, and there's a lot of attacks going on on Christians that are going to Jerusalem by by Muslims and other other groups. So that's that's a ruse. Um, number one is that the Templars weren't required to, to have to do that to protect the pilgrims um, because the Knights of St. John, which was created in 1043, had already been created as a knight order to do so and was already doing so. So we need to understand that the Knights Templar story that we get is just pablum for public consumption. 
And we need to understand who this organization was. What's their connection to modern secret societies in the uh, coming end time? as well as what is their real history and what is their core beliefs and their core religion, because they're presented as a Christian order, complete with papal bull, effective in 1128 at the Council of Troy, but they weren't. They were the typical organizational structure that we see to organizations today uh, that is polytheist-centered. So whether it's a secret society like Freemasonry, which has its roots, the modern organization in the Knights Templar in the fall, in the decentralization, you have the adepts at the top and you have the lower levels who are considered mundane, who don't know the true secrets and don't know what the adepts are doing. And that's just the beginning of the hierarchy to the mystical religions at the third level of the old system. York, as in Freemasonry would call it, equivalent to the cognate 33rd degree of the Scottish Rite. So they were polytheist at the core at the adept level. And this is a group that's going to be resurrected as an ancient knight order. And it is an order that goes back into polytheist history um, and back to and a more modern timing as of the resurrection would be the order of Constantine that had a red cross that came about at the time of Constantine. And this is a re resurrection of that order of the red cross that the Knights Templar are going to receive. But the, the Knights Templar are, are all royales and uh, mostly French royales. So they're not poor monks. There are two Cistercian monks that are there, but they're relatives of the other nine or the other seven royales, so to speak. And so these are all the nobility elite. And the Cistercians are a Gnostic order that's molded into Catholicism. And it's the monastic order that is based on the ancient Essenic monastic order. Uh, that is used for all of the monastic initiatory organizations that mold into Christianity and into the Roman Church in particular, whether or not it's the Augustines, it's the Franciscans or the Jesuits. They're all Gnostic, they're all initiatory, they're all polytheist. And so we need to understand that these Cistercian monks are monks that are you know, would have a high level within the church if they wanted to, because the black nobility is also made up of 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 royales, and the royales are sponsoring and getting in most of the popes, whether they're not if they're of the of the loyal uh, version of popes or whether or not they are of the polytheist belief system. But they're all royales and they're all educated. So when we look at the names like Godfrey de Bouillon and Hugh de Payon, that's the Anjou bloodline of Lorraine. Um, and you also have Andre, Andre Montabard. And I'll just go through some of the names. Hugh de Count of, Ch of Champagne, Geoffrey of St. Omer, Payan de Montefer, Archambault de St. Arnaud, Jeffrey Bezel and the folk of Anjou, also of the Lorraine region. There are different strains of the Anjou, but this is the Lorraine strain. And they are all royales and they were formed for a purpose. And so the ruse is, is to gain access to Jerusalem, but they have to take Jerusalem first. And so Godfrey de Bouillon and and Hugh de Payan and his battle partner, Henry de St. Clair, which is an ancestor of the founders of the St. Clairs are going to restart uh, Freemasonry as an organization uh, with fleeing Templars uh, at the takedown of the Templars in 1307 when they flee to Scotland under the protection of Robert the Bruce, who has already been excommunicated from the church, the Roman church, for killing his rival in a in a Catholic church. 
So these are all royales. And in 1090, the Bullion and his center organization is going to go to Italy in preparation to organize for the Crusades. And they're going to meet with the Calabrian monks, another Gnostic order within Catholicism, who were sponsoring Pythagorean mystery schools. <laughs> mystery schools are Gnostic polytheist schools, just as the schools are polytheist today, um, but not necessarily called a mystery school. So I'm first, and they're already operating there before the start of the Crusades. And so the bullion is going to lead with papal authority, a, a large European army that is led disproportionately by ancient Masons, and of course, at the core of the Royals of France, that are the first center power core, and are the ones who are going to successfully take Jerusalem. They are <clears throat> there for a reason, and they're working with the Bullion, and there's going to be two distinct levels of this order as it starts to progress. So when they take Jerusalem in 1099 and Godfrey de Bouillon is uh, crowned as king, although he doesn't really he's want to take the title, and so he's not necessarily the first king of Jerusalem in this era, but the facto is it's just he's, he's just saying, hey, I don't want the title, but I'm going to I'm going to rule it. But Baldwin the first and Baldwin the second are kings of Jerusalem and, and crowned with those titles that follow, and they're all Anjou. And so this is an organization that is when we talk about Masons, these are the ancient Masons that go back to Heliopolis. These are the ones that go back to Nimrod and Babel. These are the groups that are formed before the flood. This is this ancient organization of royales that has come down through history. And this is the representation of the Knights Templar as the Order of Sion, uh, first formed at the Priory of Sion in Jerusalem, uh, where the King of Jerusalem, Baldwin II, is crowned, as well as the Bullion, as well as Baldwin I was first crowned, and with a royal uh, ceremony more into the valley in terms of uh, just outside of Jerusalem and in the Notre Dame Cathedral, which just, you would be similar to like King Charles accepting the kingship and then his royal crowning, you know, about a year later. That was that sort of standard in the right of inheritance. And so or, this group that this group is made up of a very interesting group, not only of Gnostics within the church, like the Cistercians in particular, and the Calabrian monks, but they're an amalgamation of sister groups that include the Essenes, which are the basis for the monastic orders, the Sabians of the time of Jesus that are still around, the Order of Ormus, which was a Gnostic group in Alexandria, and Ormus is, is a Red Cross order that passed that emblem on to the Order of Constantine that we talked about, that St. Bernard, when he argues for the Knights Templar for their full papal bull in 1128 and writes their first constitution, provides that cross first to the Knights Templar in 1128, so you know almost 30 years after the uh, the fall of Jerusalem, and he's a Cistercian monk, right? And so we need to understand that these are all Gnostics, as we would understand them, but at that time, they would be understood as Cathars and Albigensians. These were, this was the rival belief system to the Roman Catholic Church. And the, if the Albigensian crusade rings a bell, it 
you know, started in LB, which is where they say the name comes from, but the true word is LB gens. And then see, you know, the, the suffix that goes on it, that means the bloodline of the elven dragon messiah. So it's heavily steeped in that and that whole mystery. And, and they're, they're there for the secrets of the bloodline. And it also includes um, the. It also includes the understanding that the the religion that the Templar adepts are going to be worshiping is essentially Cathar, and uh, they're called the consoled ones, and that's understood as the pure ones, in 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 Catharism and Albigensianism. And that this is a branch religion that is reestablished in France before the Crusades, well before the Crusades, by a group called the Bogomils, which is a group of Gnostic polytheists gone underground that includes Paulicians, Manichaeans, and several other groups that is going to restart their religion in in France. So this is a this is a an alliance of all types of polytheist religions and of course the knights templar is going to be a initiatory organization and this is going to be an organization that has adepts or the grand masters as they're called in the secret societies and with um the the knights templar and they're going to worship a different pantheon a different religion different gods at the adapt level just as freemasons do at the adapt level and have this ruse this disguise of christianity on the outside and they're there to get to excavate jerusalem to get ancient documents genealogies which is very important to the anjou who take their bloodlines back to the merovingians who take their bloodline and and Dagobert is the last Merovingian who is the one who th these three Anjou, the folk of Anjou, de Peon and de Bouillon take their bloodlines back to. And that the Merovingians were a combination of bloodlines that included um, several giant bloodlines as part of that dragon bloodline of the elven bloodline, and that it also included King Saul and Benjamite bloodline, where they believe they have the right to be the kings of Jerusalem because Joshua provided Jerusalem to the Benjamites, and also grafting in bloodlines of David for the Davidic uh, prophecies and blessings and covenants, and also allegedly and they all come out with false evidence on this down the road, so they say, but from Mary Magdalene and Jesus, who they say did not die on the cross. And so this bloodline is inherited by the Merovingians through, in their story of Josephus, the third son of Mary Magdalene and Jesus, who was taken to... Uh, England by um, Joseph of Arimathea in their mythology, and then he's going to intermarry into the Pendragon dynasties of Wales. And then at the time of one of the daughters of this bloodline, Aragon is going to intermarry with Aminabad of the Merovingian bloodlines to Sion or Grath that bloodline into the Merovingians, and which is why they are interested in getting a hold of Jerusalem to set themselves up as 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 part of as, as the kings of Jerusalem. But in their vision, you know, the end time would come a lot sooner. They're trying to bring it about sooner than not. And so that's the gambit that that is going on here. Now, just after their organization and 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 setting up within the covenant land, they are going to start working with a group called the Assassins. And the Assassins are part of Sufism. 
some people will say, well, not really, but they're part of the fat men dynasty and those bloodlines and part of that promotion of Sufism uh, that is working in the same way as Gnosticism, as we would understand that as the Cathars and the Albigensians in France, showing public support for the Roman Church and Christianity, but worshipping the ancient polytheist gods, because it all goes back to Zoroastrianism and the religion of the giants and the Indo-Aryans, and the Batman dynasty does the same thing. They show monotheism through Islam on the surface, but they are polytheism within Islam. And so the assassins are set up as kind of like warrior monks. And they have an ancient or an older organizational structure. I think it's based on an even older organizational structure, but just uh, to stay with the uh, the assassins, they are now going to work in partnership with the Templars for over a hundred years in, 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 in the covenant land. And that they're gonna show interesting respect for the Templars who are sort of a junior order to them. And the Templars are going to adapt the organizational structure of the assassins and this is the organizational structure that they bring back to europe that all the secret societies are going to utilize going forward and uh, you know you can see part of that sufism um, in in freemasonry today as you get into the shriners for example it's sort of represented and just as the freemasons will have a number of knights templar uh, honorary degrees and, and rituals and the KT ritual in particular, that still is part of Freemasonry to, to this day. And so this is an organization that is keeping a secret and they're and according to the records, they find these doctrines of, of the genealogies, but we have to understand that they are worshiping a different pantheon of gods and they are not yeah. these poor knights these are the most powerful people of france and that empire that organization is going to expand to include all the other mason, royal mason orders you know so you look at the royal mason order of the anjou and there's the three different branches have their own version of this but king philippe uh bourbon uh, son of Juan Carlos of Spain, currently is the king of Jerusalem, as this title has been passed down since 1118, and that he inherited through the, the Habsburgs, and he's the leader of the Bourbon section of the Knights of the Golden Fleece. And the Golden Fleece was the material that the gods on their clothes from so that their physical bodies wouldn't decay when they took a physical body and the same material that Jason and the Argonauts are looking for for the demigods because Jason is a Nephilim or a Raphaim depending on whether or not you place them before or after the flood and so you have other ancient organizations like the Royal Order of the Garter not the one that some of the politicians belong to in England but that's the Windsor um order and you also have the knights of the seraphim to name another one that is the odin or the norse uh, order of the royals that the sinclairs come from and the st Clairs come from and so when we look at these uh these orders that are still in place to this day that said at the top of the secret society orders, understand that at that time of the Templars, as they're forming, it's a very much a centralized organization and has a senior order and a junior order. And it's officially sort of separated into that in 1118 with Huda Peon taking over the Grand Master of the Priory of Sion and the Knights Templar. Uh, and it's the Council of the Barons that is going to be the priory of Sion and the senior order that appoints all of the kings as that starts to progress. 
And so this is, uh, uh, as I say, very much a polytheist organization with polytheist rituals. So I'll let you in there because I covered a lot of ground. Wasn't uh, Hugh DePayne's, he was the leader when they were um, arrested and put to death, wasn't he? No, no, that was that was somebody else. Hugh DePayne was part of the original founding in ba founders okay. yeah yeah and then in 1307 that's so a couple hundred years later is when um, oh, okay. the templars so it's a different grandmaster at that time yeah all right but he's the first grandmaster in the reorganized junior and senior organizational structures yeah and for for those who haven't like looked into this and done research um but we'll probably have seen the movie uh kingdom of heaven yeah um baldwin the second is the leper king correct or is it baldwin nope. the third it's um uh, a little bit later than that it'll be like baldwin the fifth i think okay. um and it He's reigning in about 1170 to 1180, just before the fall of Jerusalem. But he's from that bloodline and that right of inheritance as, as it comes down. And he dies just uh, before the taking of Jerusalem. Yeah. And that's in 1188 or 1187. Yeah. For um, everyone who heard that and saw uh, part one of this, I got that wrong because I said Baldwin the <laughs> third and uh in book two uh I cover off that whole reign of kings as I follow that through so that people can sort of make sense of how that history transpired and what's that connection is to the Jesuits as the new Templars yeah I really recommend getting the book if you if you've read book one then you'll definitely enjoy book two. Yeah, I think people will really enjoy book two, particularly the, the Christians. And But if you're wanting more information on secret societies, I'm going to complete what I didn't do in book uh, one there. And if you want to know more about giants and you ever thought uh, there was information on giants within the Bible, you're really going to like this and you're going to really like how it connects into end time prophecy. And yeah. so... And I didn't cover off the Jesuits in book one because it's such a controversial issue. And, mm -hmm. I, and the book was so big already. So I, I laid down the platform for how they get there. And then I complete that in book two. But I understand it's the same type of religion with the Jesuits because, again, it's the Egyptian polytheist religion for the most part that they're interpreting everything through the seven sacred sciences, which is the basis for mysticism. And that everything they do at that adept level is distinctly non-Christian. Yeah. And so in the Knights Templars, uh, some people say this even gets down to um, the mundane members. I'm not quite convinced of that. I think it's more the adepts. But they would spit initiates as, as, the, as the records show, which is why it's a bit confusing. Initiate is both an adept and starting off because they're all initiated right? It's just the level of initiation yeah. that they have. But they were required to spit on the cross and deny uh, Jesus as the Christ. That's horrible. And they believe that Jesus didn't die on the cross, that he survived and was taken down and started this bloodline that they believe is Zion into their various bloodlines. And that they believe they, you know, the they have the records of this secret as well. They were called consoled brothers, as I as I talked about. So they're they were doing, and that's a Cathar term, an Albigensian term for priests of the of the perfecti. And so they the adepts were practicing black robed Gnostics, polytheists. And they were doing black masses, as we would sort of understand that. And so they believe that um, they believe that their God and the God that they worshipped, and it's not 
clear to me whether that's the chief god. I don't think so, as I understand pantheism. But the god that they were worshipping was a warrior god, because there were warrior monks. And that this warrior god was named Baphomet, or Baphomet, depending on how you want to pronounce that. It has been said that the Baphomet was regarded as a god by various groups and organizations, such as the Knights Templar. It is most famously portrayed as a goat-headed deity with a human body, harboring both male and female attributes, an androgen. And it was originally a Scythian, Indoarian god. And it is a god that was the same god that was celebrated with Galatians and Celtics, which were Scythians and, and Indo-Aryans, even though there's four or five different groups of Indo-Aryans. And they worshipped it as the head of wisdom. And they called it Agios Icarus Baphomet. And that means holy, strong Baphomet, strong as an Icarus. Icarus is the Greek word in the New Testament in the book of Revelation in chapter 10, 1 and 1821 for the mighty angel. So this is talking about a mighty fallen angel of wisdom. We know Azazel is the, the god of wisdom in polytheism and particularly with the Western secret societies and with uh, with other secret societies all the way out throughout the organization. And so this was a watcher goat god. And this is a degraded seraphim god. This is how these rebellious seraphims um, looked after if they weren't in the flood and were around after the flood. We know them as satyr gods. Yeah, the deity has been worshipped as a pan god and an order of pan gods after the flood, uh, you know, since the since the Indo-Aryans. And um, so anything associated with goat gods uh, like Lupercalus um, festivals in the time of February at the time of just before uh, a couple of days before what we would understand St. Valentine's Day. Uh, is an ancient Etruscan uh, festival or Indo-Aryan, just as the Scythians are the Proto-Greeks and Indo-Aryans. That worship goes back before the migration of the peoples from Babel into those areas. And that's an orgy of sexual violence and uh, taking of women. And I won't go through all of the gruesome details of it, but that's the nature of this religion and this god that they're talking about and that name breaks down as bapho mitris and it can mean father mitra or father mithras as it would be understood originally and mithras is obviously uh, associated with mithraism which was the religion of the army at the time of of the Roman Empire, that is a branch religion of Zoroastrianism, which is the Indo-Aryan religion of the giants. So this is the religion, and Batho, Batho Mitras is a major player as this pan-god, and he's understood as an ancient seraphim and a pendragon god. Now, pendragon means head dragon or chief dragon. Again, Azazel as a seraphim before being degraded and now being depicted as a pan god, as a, as a degraded watcher, he was a seraphim and the chief of the watchers who was the most warrior-like angel and strong, as Az and Azaz in Hebrew means strong and powerful. He was a powerful angel, El being an angel or a god to complete the name. Azazel is also the scapegoat on the Day of Atonement, which is the second goat that sacrificed without explanation on the Day of Atonement, whereas the first goat is for the sins of Israel, 
this is seemingly for the sins of the world, but we're not told that. That's just, I think it's more inference. I think it's for the sins of the antediluvian world and why it's called the scapegoat, Hebrew Azazel. Because Azazel is the one who is blamed for providing most of the knowledge and arming the world with war and its technology and its application, as the Book of Enoch talks about. And so he is the mighty Icarus type angel, as they like to classify him. And the leader of the watchers, who likely comes out of, out of the pit in Revelation 9 as Abaddon and Apollyon as the destroyer, because he's the destroyer of the antediluvian world. It would have been destroyed by fire, I think, with the technology that the angels had provided, lest God permitted the flood to come. And the intercession permits all the names in the book of life to be fulfilled that were written in there from before creation. That's when God intercedes. Now, if that sounds interesting and people will say, well, watcher, well, but that doesn't mean it's an angel. And I want, for people who aren't familiar with the Bible or the Hebrew or the Greek in the Bible, understand that Watcher shows up in Daniel four, four times. They come from the throne of God where the seraphim are part of the four groups of Watchers. Watcher there is the Hebrew word Ayir. And it's compounded into a word Satir as it's transliterated into English. And that's S-A, put an apostrophe, Ayir for Watcher. And that these are watcher angels, and sa means hairy and connected to goats, just as Azazel is connected to goats. This is a satyr goat god that shows up after the flood, and that satyrs show up in Isaiah 13 with other interesting angelic descriptions, and Isaiah 34, and as double gods worshipped a couple of times as it's translated in the Old Testament. So these were degraded watchers um, after the flood, probably before the flood as well, just before they went to the, the pit prison. And what's interesting about that is we understand the connection to Indo-Aryan, which is the religion of the Templars, it's Zoroastrianism, it's global Gnosticism, it's, it's all that, that root religion that goes back to Enoch, son of Cain, that became the organizational structure for the giants before the flood and after the flood and reintroduced by Nimrod at Babel, which will be, which is the root word in Hebrew for Babylon used in the Greek New Testament for Babylon, the religion and world empire of economics and uh, political uh, dealings, as well as it controls the 10 kings uh, in the end time. So it's an economic system, it's a city, it's a religion, and it's a geopolitical organization all rooted in Babel and modeled after an antichrist type figure with a universal religion for the end time, just as what they did before the flood, because nothing is new under the sun. So there is a Greek god group that includes names like Pan, uh, Ijapan, Inuus, and I'm going to come back to Inuus or Innus, depending on how you want to pronounce that, um, or Bacchus or Cernunos, and in the Etruscans, Cern. And that comes down through a tradition of the um, mystery religions of the old Etruscans, which again were the Proto-Romans, and they're the settlers who did the seven hills of Babylon as part of that and are the people of Romulus and Remus. Uh, and again, people from Babel are going to settle amongst them. And these are from that religion that comes down through the Janai uh, mystical sect. And they have nine main gods in that pantheon. And one of them is called CERN. And what's interesting about the word CERN, not only is it associated with CERN, as we understand it today, um, and destroyer gods, um, and the pit prison, and interdimensional things like that, um, CERN is an Indo-Aryan word. That means horned, horned head, or the horned head god, as the 
second title would normally go with that. And so in the interesting language, they just called them CERN. And that would be the Romanized version of Inuus as it came down through history of those uh, satyr order of gods after the flood. And so this is, um, this is the god that the Knights Templar worshipped. And this would be the angel they would want to bring back out of the pit prison for the end time. Um, and he's the leader of the Watchers. And so when we look at the Knights Templar, we can say, okay, well, they were disbanded in 1307. What's the big deal? Well, 33 invisible ones of the Royal Masons in 1317 went to talk to the Pope and say, we would like to reinsert the Templars under our control back into the Roman Church. And so the Pope decided at that time that he would uh, go ahead with it, but he wasn't going to allow the invisible ones, as they like to call themselves, um, of the bloodlines of the royals of the council of barons that always is appointing uh, kings and approving the bloodlines um, th he was going to put his own people in place and so what the invisible 33 did is they poisoned the pope <laughs> and then they had to go underground because they were um, <laughs> at odds with the roman church and, and the hegemony that was in power at the time there so but it's these invisible ones that are part of the Rosicrucian order that starts to form in 1188, a year after the fall of Jerusalem in 1187. And this is the senior order of the Knights Templar. Notice both are a Red Cross order, the Rosi, Rosicrucis. And that the senior order separates in 1188 at a cutting of the elm, elm tree orm, or orme, associated with Ormus, one of the groups, and one of the holy trees of the Indo-Aryans that we see pictured in the genealogical tree um, that has its roots that goes down to the celestial mafia godfathers and Sheol and Hades in the earth and another dimension. Um, that's their imagery. And uh, so this organization separates from the Templar, and they're not there to protect the Templars when King Philip the Fair and Clement V decide they want the assets of the Templars and bring them down in 1307. But they start up their own, continue their own order with separate Grand Masters uh, after that. And so you have Sinclairs and the Geezers, because this is a, a ceremony that happens at Geezer um castle uh, before they start to expand the organizational structure of the secret societies again after the fall of the templars so in 1188 the organization begins 1307 many of the adepts of the knights templar in france go to scotland under the protection of robert the bruce that we talked about and under the protection of the sinclairs and the sinclairs are going to sponsor a new organization called the uh, Freemasonry group for the escaping adepts. And then in 1323, Robert the Bruce is going to create a secondary order. And this is the first visible showing of the Rosicrucians and the Red Cross order. That's going to be the senior order to the uh, Knights Templar for the adepts. And the invisible ones are 33 families, the 33 invisible ones that we know as the Council of 33, which the 13 families would sit above. And then they're going to expand that lower to the committee of 300 families as time progresses. And then the Rosicrucian orders are going to have bloodlines in there at the top half of the Rosicrucian order with ones rising through Freemasonry and Illuminati um, to higher levels, let's say to seventh degree in the old system that would populate the bottom level of the Rosicrucian order. Um, and so 
Uh, we have different levels of senior and junior within the Rosicrucian order as well. There's actually three different separations, but it's the top one that's going to be the royales that are populating it and controlling uh, that order and the secondary orders within it. The uh, knights, the hospitalers of St. John, um, were they, I know they weren't uh, a part of the Templar Knights, but were they a uh, society that was polytheistic as well? Yeah, and they took they take um, the name St. John in the beginning because they draft uh, John the Baptist as an Essene, but of a polytheist nature, right? And they also draft, you know, Jesus, uh, James, and they adopt most of the patriarchs into the religion. So that's not unusual. Their organizational structure will be reshaped after the forming of the Knights Templar, and they will have the exact same organizational structure of the Knights Templar. In fact, the Knights Templar will become the model for all the Knight Orders, whether it's the Teutonic Knights, um, and all the other ones that, that are going to populate um, the nations throughout Europe, because they're all royal orders, right? Um, and so it becomes that organizational structure for all of these top end royal bloodline orders that would report into the 13 families, the 33 families, the and the uh, 300 families. And that this uh, these orders of the night uh, are still understood in the rituals of the lower levels, and many of them actually receive knight status in those different degrees. And the Jesuits who become the restarted organization within the Catholic Church um, by uh, a fellow by the name of Francis Borgia, and if that name sounds familiar, he's of the Borgia Black nobility of the Pope line, uh, but he's a Basque uh, in the king of uh, of uh, Spain at this time, and he bails Ignatius out of jail during the Inquisition, and then sponsors him through his relationships and the help of the Spanish king to become the Jesuit uh, order within the church. And uh, he's also the Grand Master at that time of another knight order that was formed in 1317 as the Montessa order that captured all of the Knights Templar wealth so that the church couldn't get with it. And also the Calatrava order is a similar knight order that did the same thing to capture all of the um, Templar wealth in Portugal, the uh, nation that was named and sponsored by the Templars, the Port of the Grail. Well, bloodline is the Grail in the, in the, blood, in the Templar belief system. And so by, thir by 1550s, Francis Borgia becomes a Jesuit. By 1565, he becomes the third Grand Master. And it's all for a plan to control the Jesuits within the church and to get a hold of the banking that they're going to move to Switzerland, where most of the wealth actually escaped to, where the Knights of St. John were already set up uh, previously in the 1200s. And that's why you have the white cross of the Knights of St. John on the Swiss um, flag and the sort of the imagery for modern banking. And so today you have the Rothschilds, you have the uh, Vatican banking and the Knights Templars banking that's all centralized in into Switzerland. And so this is the order that becomes the new Templars as they're understood within Catholicism. And they're there as part of their original doctrine of the organization of the Templars is to create the new Babylon within the Christian church, the Roman church. Yes, it, it's funny how all of these organizations are 
Roman Catholic on the outside and to the world, you know, Christian on the outside, but they have their their secret uh, religious practices, you know, that they do behind closed doors. All the way back from the, you know, the the original Templars and uh, to the modern day secret societies, you know, even you've got like with the Masons, you've got a secret society within a secret society. Yeah, and it's very very complex. Their organizations, and there's just so many organizations that. Which is why when, you know, I decided to do book two, I would start talking more about what they call the Thelemic tree. So not only is it used for their genealogical tree for the oak, ash or elm tree, uh, but also for the cedar of Lebanon, which is the organizational structure for the secret societies, which those organizations that I've mentioned were trunk organizations. The Jesuits are not a trunk organization. They branch into um, uh, a trunk organization. I would think there would be because they were sponsored in their um, initial beginning by the black nobility with the senior black nobility, but then with the junior black nobility um, in the late 1800s. I think they're going to be going into the Committee of 300, but one could make an argument that they're into the uh, Council of 33 if they believe that they're actually still controlled by the senior organization. Yeah, what's interesting is is that, you know, the other doctrine that they were working on and was is called the United Kingdom. So, go back to what you're talking about this United this Kingdom of Heaven movie that's talked about that repositions some of the people a little bit, but all those characters are real and are part yeah. of the bloodlines. Um, and that was called the kingdom of heaven because that's the United Kingdom of the world that they wanted to rule the world. And if you think that name United Kingdom, that was also used for the British Commonwealth empire is a coincidence, it is not. It was it's part of the same movement for the same purposes. And so be be wary of that term, the United Kingdom of the world, uh, because they wanted to establish that so that their grand monarch, as they talk about him in the secret societies, would be the ruler of the world and sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. This is the dragon messiah. This is the uh, the. Uh, elven blood bloodline of the Magianic dragon that they've been plotting to put there forever. And anything that is associated with Templarism is the antithesis of Christianity as it's meant to be and anything that's written in the Bible. And we're told over and over and over and over not to swear oaths and that you will be held accountable for those oaths, if you swear that oath, then you had better fulfill it because you, God will hold you accountable for it. But we're advised not to over and over and over. And yet, this is based on an oath-based system in the mystical religions, and that all goes back to the oath sworn on Mount Hermon before the flood, and then again after the flood. And it's the oath of the watchers to carry it out to the end, the oath of harem anathema, no matter what the consequences, no matter what would happen to them, they were going to create a race to lead humanity into destruction. And that's their purpose. So the purpose of the Templars is to recreate the scenario to destroy humanity. And they do that through creating their worldwide hegemony that we will understand with the coming end time and all the different horrors that you see in prophecy, particularly against humans and particularly in a more spiteful way against anybody who stands against them, like monotheists, Christians, um, th they will express that blood hatred uh, just as the Amalekites 
and the giants swore oaths to wipe Israel from the face of the earth um, in the time of uh, the you know the age of Israel and its creation and throughout its uh, history. The original Knights Templar and the Crusades with their dominionism. Um, it's only dominionism in the sense, like the original crusades, like you were saying, they weren't they they weren't trying to fulfill Christian eschatology as we see it. Uh, you know that they are using the Book of Revelation as a playbook for uh, the other side. So, what we're not told biblically in eschatology is how that remnant shows up for the end time. And again, this is all happening through free choice. And so this has been made available to bring a scenario for the end time because of the polytheists. They understand end time prophecy as well. They have a different view on the outcome. But they know that that has to have, they have to have Israel in place if they're going to bring about the end time. And so what we do need to know is, is that they need to be in the covenant land and in control of Jerusalem in the end time. And then once they're there, we apply the prophecies that we've been provided throughout the Old and New Testament. Yeah, I've got a, a friend who I actually met through. Um, I originally met him through YouTube, him watching my YouTube videos and commenting on them. And then we eventually started emailing and then uh, talking through Facebook Messenger uh, because it's got the, you know, the video calls and whatnot. But his family, um, he's a what you would consider a a Palestinian Jew. You know, he didn't come from Europe, but his, his family has literally been there for 3000 years. Um, You know, Israel of course became a nation in 48, but Jews have, you know, they've been there, you know, throughout history, just not, as i guess a recognized um nation by the rest of the world yeah yeah and uh so i guess i guess you know if you look at the knights templar they were the most powerful military organization at that time uh and this organization moves back to to Europe and it changes the whole trajectory in so many different ways of of the West. And that this is an organizational structure that's connected to Sufis and who has a similar goal and agenda. Now, those are different bloodlines. Uh, And we should also understand then that there will be Mahdi's, as they call them in Islam, yeah. uh, one Sunni, one Shia. Who knows? Well, they, there might be a Sufi one as well, and they're going to do battle in the end time. Yeah, and the uh, the assassins were uh, a part of a branch of Islam called the. I'll probably butcher the name, but the Ismaili sect yep. and. They were on the the fringe, the outskirts of Islam anyway, yep. and it, it wasn't something that was the way it was the whole time of the Order of Assassins, but eventually they broke from Islam altogether. Well, they did have, uh, yeah, they did break because they were being persecuted by the two, um, two other sects, the Sunnis and the and the Shia. So they act, most of yeah. them had to flee, um, and you know, towards uh, India in that direction. Uh, that's the Parsi, and uh, you know, that's one of the ancient names for the Indo-Aryan 
Persians, uh, the people mm-hmm. of the East, and the settlement that the Achaemenid Persian kings, for example, and their bloodlines go back to, um, they settled in Persia, but there was also uh, another branch of that same group that settled the Indus Valley uh, that created Hinduism. And so Zoroastrianism and Hinduism would be the two earliest known versions of the religion of the giants or the religion of the Templars um, that that we would have sort of written records on after the flood. Yeah, uh, I have done quite a few uh, videos and uh episodes of the podcast on uh zoroaster or zarathustra uh however you want to pronounce his name and the the religion um because it was by the time of um i think it was darius in, in um the the king who was the Persian king that took over Babylon when the Persian Empire, yep. you know, took control. It, it became the official religion of Babylon. And, you know, when the Jews were released to go back and rebuild the temple, not even most of them went back. You know, a lot of them stayed right there in Babylon. They had lives, they had families. And um, I think that had a lot to do with uh, some of that mysticism from Zoroastrianism coming into the religion by the time of Jesus, you know, you had the Essenes in Egypt and you also had the Essenes uh, that are associated with the Dead Sea Scrolls. But the, you know, we hear Jesus rebuking the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees a lot. And there are certain things he says about their traditions, but Jesus never specifically goes into their traditions. You have to go, you know, kind of outside of the the Bible to look at these Silk Road religions and Gnosticism with all of its different sects to kind of see what could have bled into um you know old testament judaism yeah and you know kabbalism doesn't really show up into um jewish society the southern kingdom uh until after judah is exiled in babylon and that's when it's brought back that's when you get the lilith introductions of doc uh of understanding who Samael is and that's when that all sort of comes in but the Essene version as you were noting that was there even before Mm -hmm. and uh uh, you know because they were part of the original people that came out of out of Egypt they just believe yeah so that's the western Egyptian version um that was there before and then the eastern version comes in and that's why you have so many different groups in the time of Jesus that are occupying the land of the covenant, as well as the Sadducees, as well as the Pharisees, as well as the Essenes, but they were all operating in the same area. And, you know, that's why Simon the Magus is there, because there is a welcoming arms for the same sort of religion. Again, that's yeah. more the Eastern or the Western Egyptian part of Gnosticism, but uh, from Alexandria, but, it starts to it helps you to understand what is going on in the period that uh, Jesus is on earth and before and after if you can understand these different groups and what their belief systems were yeah i know unfortunately because of these different uh groups and their belief systems but mainly the essenes um i have found when talking with uh, modern day New Agers and Gnostics that they believe that 
uh, Jesus was an Essene, but not uh, just an Essene. He was uh, a Gnostic adept, and yes. that he traveled to India. And you know, the reason he was able to work the miracles that he was able to work was because he had achieved enlightenment. And you know that Jesus was just a man like you or me, and it, it's sad. It, it really is. It it makes it hard to do anything more than tell people like that the truth, and you know, pray for them, and let the Holy Spirit, you know, do His work. Yeah, you know that word. Um... Nazarene that they like to use, that's not from Nazareth, where the Essenes get that word that they use as they draft in Jesus and John the Baptist. And Jesus is not considered in the Essenic belief system the Son of God, believed to be a teacher of righteousness, one of many that came along the way. And same with John the Baptist. He's be equivalent to John the Baptist. And so that word that the Essenes use for uh, Nazarene is comes from Hebrew Natsar, which means ancient knowledge and guardians of ancient knowledge. That's part of the whole Gnostic yeah. meaning and system. And that the Essenes, they would not give up the names of the angels they worshipped even upon torture and death. Mm. And uh, there's there I have a you know document I send out for people at no charge on the Essenes if people wanted to get a hold of me through my website just ask for the Essene document and I give some history from the historians and the church fathers describing who these Essenes were and uh, it's and I know there's a lot of people out there who say the Essenes you know they are the good ones well and then some people say well there's two different sects yes there are two different sects they just practice the same ends <laughs> through a few different rituals <laughs> yeah so but they weren't but Jesus was not in the scene and in fact Paul spoke against the Essenes. He didn't name them as such, but he he told them not to let people impose ascetic food laws on you, as the Essenes yeah. did, and the doctrines of angels and those who worship angels. He was referring to the Essenes, yes. and they're the same ones that are seen in the book of Ezekiel in chapter 8, who are also you know, worshiping to the east and to Tammuz because they understand they're the western part of the original Babel religion. Mm. And we have to be doing our level best to share Christ every day in everything that we say and do, but mainly everything that we do that way when we are actually sharing the gospel you know verbally with someone then we'll already have shared it with them if if they are someone who knows us and has seen us and is aware of us you don't want to get caught sharing the gospel with someone who has seen you at your very worst. Uh, I mean, it, 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 as much as it shouldn't um, have anything to do with what people believe about Christ, it does. It affects people's perception of Jesus. Absolutely. And it's so important to remember as as I think we get deeper into the fig tree generation, that if we can't role model who we are, then why would people want to believe us or uh, want to take a, an opportunity to open up a Bible uh, and let alone to accept Jesus? If we can't properly role model, then we're going to do more harm than good when people need us the most. You are absolutely right, and 
that's why it's so important to make disciples not to not just you know uh share the gospel and someone come to christ and then be forgotten about because uh you better believe the other side the other team they don't just uh win converts and leave them alone you know they don't win them and forget about them they <laughs> they teach them and people are interested by it because they have people willing to show them the power in it and what the sad thing is is the true power is in Jesus Christ the true power is in the believer the spirit filled believer but and this is something that i have really come to recognize over the past year i i've known it and i've said it many times throughout the years but it's something that has become very clear and personal personal to me from knowing someone who lives in the Middle East where, you know, this war is going on. But here in North America, the freedom that we have in both Canada and the United States, it is truly more of a hindrance for Christians in the fig tree generation especially when we get to the great tribulation then it will be for people who are used to living with real tribulation they have had to go through true persecution you know they their lives or their well-being or their family's well-being and safety is on the line just because they are associated with Jesus Christ. And there's not many of us, at least not in America, who can say that. Now, I, I'm sure there is coming a time a lot sooner than a lot of us believe when that will be the case. But it, it's not here yet. And because it's coming is the reason that I say that the fact that we have been both so very free and so very deceived at the same time, it's made for <laughs> really the, the, what you see in the church of Laodicea. Yep. I agree. In any case, uh, this is the Remnant Warrior, guys. And Brother Gary, I want to thank you so much for coming on with us. And I thank you all for joining us. Until next time, God bless each and every one of you.